So hi everyone, good afternoon, and welcome to this talk of the Ming Shei Institute seminar series on integrated systems in collaboration with the IEEE SSCS Joint Student Chapter at the University of Southern California. Today we are pleased and honored to have this talk presented by Professor Yahya Tusi, entitled Toward Energy Efficient and Scalable Millimeter Wave Systems. Professor Yahya Tusi received his PhD degree in 2012 from the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering at Cornell University. In 2014, he joined the IBM TJ Watson Research Center at Yorktown Heights, New York, to develop the next generation of millimeter wave phased array transceivers for wireless communication systems. And since 2017, he has been with the ECA department at the University of Minnesota Twin Cities. His current research interests are in high performance integrated circuits and novel architectures for millimeter wave and terahertz systems with applications in communication, sensing, and healthcare. Dr. Tusi is the co-recipient of ISSCC Lewis Award for Outstanding Paper and the Journal of Solid State Best Paper Award, both in 2017, the DARPA Young Faculty Award in 2020, and the DARPA Director's Fellowship Award in 2022. Professor Tusi, we, we would like to welcome you again, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for waiting. I'm very glad to be here at the USC campus for the first time. Um, I would uh, like to start uh, by just mentioning this code, which I like because it captures some of the intentions that we have in the wireless domain. We want to connect everything together. And uh, I think still after more than a century, that, that seems, seems to be what we want to do. And um, there is tremendous progress that has happened with all the next the generations of wireless and we are connected more than ever, but there is also a lot of objects that we want to connect, uh, so we don't have to do a lot of things ourselves anymore. Machines, robots, all of these things require more complicated wireless systems. And in our group, uh, we try to look into some of the challenges, especially in the hardware front end that we have to deal with when we want to do massive scaling of uh, wireless systems. And I would think that there are two things that, uh, if you think about the a machine uh, autonomous system uh, and where there are a lot of these machines um, that supposedly would want to work together. The first thing is they all have to be able to communicate with each other. There is a lot of data communication. So broadband communication, that's a one big thing about wireless systems. And the other thing is low energy processing and sensing in the front end. Um, the reason is that we don't want to send all of our data through the network. There are many cases that we want to do local sensing and local processing. So because of privacy, because of power efficiency and things like that. So uh, the first talk, uh, part of my talk, I will talk about what is going to be um, related to broadband communication and that is scalable arrays. So, so we're all familiar with the Frisk equation. We know that uh, we are really limited by the power that we transmit and the gain of our transmitter receiver if we want to have an effective link. Um, and, you know, we have this uh, fundamental a limit in scaling as uh, processes have stopped to improve the Fmax and the saturated power. And this is really just for single transistor CMOS. If we look into other PAs and, you know, and you folks, especially in this department, you guys are working to improve the PA significantly. I mean, powers higher than this have been achieved. But just to make the argument that the transmit power is something that is really, really difficult to increase by even 3 dB. Uh, but on the other hand, the gain it seems like we can get tremendous gain by using phase array. So it's it's certainly a worthwhile effort to try and make large arrays instead of putting all of our focus on the power because the array supposedly can give us much power and much higher power. And if you think about an array with a dimension of an aperture of D, if we just look into the basic antenna equations, and a dimension of D squared would mean that the gain of the transmit and receive antenna are really going to increase with the square of the frequency, right? If you assume it to be array. So in a way, you can argue that if everything else is kept fixed and we just increase the frequency, our received power would actually increase with frequency square, which of course is not going to happen, but it's going to compensate the drop in the power by a factor of 20 dB per decade. But that's not the case. I mean, if we look into the phase arrays, 
we still have the similar trend that we have in PSAT of the PAs. And the reason is the size of the PA, uh, the, the phase arrays is very difficult to scale, especially as we go to a higher and higher frequencies. Now, at lower frequencies, uh, what I mean by lower frequencies is really below 100 gigahertz. There's been tremendous work to increase the power. I mean, there are these research groups that are doing like, hundreds of elements. Um, however, um, it seems like we're not doing a good job in doing like thousands of elements. It's very difficult, and we'll see why. But um, you know, if I if I want to give, like, I have a, I have been doing, I've, I have been um, as one of the small uh, like one of the one of the people that has been doing in this phase array um, area. Um, I um, I do think that uh, doing phase arrays is a very difficult thing to do. Designing phase arrays is extremely challenging. Um, so. The question is, how can we improve? How can we improve this? How can we get this trend to higher so that we can get, you know, we can get more range, uh, more effective communication systems? Um, so, so what is the problem? I mean, in, in our, in my opinion, so this is one of the big problems. I mean, phaser is very difficult. There's a lot of challenges, but one of the problems with the the normal H tree of a phaser is that, um, you know, I say it's high loss, not scalable, and requires phase calibration. Because everything is distributed through this complicated network, um, this means that you need very complex PCBs, very complex uh, routing, a very long design cycle, like few months, six months, and talk with people that do these things, like tens of thousands of dollars just to create this network of distribution to have like hundreds of elements. So it's doable. It's not like I'm not saying it's not possible, but it's not something you can buy for your house like, from. You know, like a store. It's just very high-end technologies can do these things, and people have been improving these. It's not like this is the traditional way that phasers have been built, but now we have like chip design and like multi-chip tiles and complex boarding. So the scalability is being addressed in some sense, but still, it's very difficult. There is a lot of effort to calibrate, which basically is an argument that these are still expensive uh, uh, phase arrays to build. So what we're trying to do is to see what can what can we do to, to, to improve the manufacturing in the sense of reducing the cost and making it simpler. Um, and fundamentally, if we look into the phase array, you know, this distribution network is a global distribution. So global distribution means that as we increase the number of elements, it just becomes harder and harder, lossier, more challenging, and the cost increases exponentially. So um, instead of doing that, why not just try to construct an array by just adding elements to a previously synchronized one um, from a very basic point of view. If we just add one element and we try to adjust the phase of that element to its all the synchronized network, we can potentially have a near element scaling thing, something that only requires the elements to communicate with their uh, near neighbors. So, so this is um, something that can be scaled. And, and if you think about the beam forming concept, um, you know, we know there is a, this deterministic relationship between the phase of the elements and the beam angle. Now, in a normal phase array, what we do is we just uh, create this phase by just a series of phase shifts that have a constant step with them. Now, um, one of the differences between a global distribution and something that is local is that we actually have even a simpler way of adjusting the phase because we don't have to go all around um, the circle to have all the different phases for a large array. It's just really the same phase that we want. We just set it between the elements. So it should be easier and it should be more scalable in concept. Uh, so this so far is a motivation. And you know, uh, people have been looking into this for, for a while, like you know, uh, like probably over 30 years, this concept has been uh, thought about in the, in the context of uh, couple oscillators and like biological systems that rely on local interaction between elements. So we have looked, in, looked into this um, and um, the idea of doing active coupling between oscillators is one of those things that seems to be uh, uh, the closest thing as circuit designers that we can do to control the frequency of oscillators and their phases by adjusting the coupling between them. So, so the, the idea of uh, Adler's equation and adjusting the frequency and phase by adjusting the delay is something that we have used to create uh, what we call a scalable array. 
Now, in theory, if we it, it, it turns out and we can show that if we adjust, if we can connect these oscillators in some specific ways, if we and if we adjust their phases in uh, a designated uh, profile, uh, we can we can first of all guarantee they're all synchronized together at scale, and then we can also adjust their phases in a very deterministic way. Uh, but this is all in theory, right? So far, theoretical work. Um, and then we can also, I mean, um, this is this is actually work before I came to Minnesota, but um, just to show you that well, when we um, when we do this for a 16 element, we can see that uh, well, before we connect the couplings, we have like a bunch of different frequencies, and then when we connect them, they all synchronize. And we can also show that uh, you can do uh, some level of beam forming for these uh, arrays. This is like a 16 element. But when we look into look deeper into this concept, con concept, one of the problems is, you know, couple oscillators and the Adler's equation tells us that there is um, a bad, uh, um, a locking bandwidth. So if the frequency between the oscillators starts to deviate and go further than that, they won't synchronize. And in fact, even if you are in the locking bandwidth, the more different these frequencies are, the chance of locking starts to drop. So we can see that as the size of array scales from a four by four to maybe like eight by eight to 12 by 12, you need more matching between the elements. And eventually it means that we can't scale this this way. It won't, it won't work from a practical point of view. So uh, it, it, it would work. We just have to make sure we do a lot of calibration. So we thought, what's, uh, what can we do to make this even better? So the problem with an Adler's equation is it's a first order PLL, right? It's a PLL that frequency and phase in a way are interconnected with each other. So we thought that um, instead of doing Adler's equation, why not we use like a more second order concept in a second order PLL, we know that we can adjust the phase and frequency independently because we have two degrees of freedom. Uh, and in principle, if we use a second order PLL, we can also construct 2D arrays with it. We can, con we can connect two, oscillate, two uh, sources and have two charge pumps and add their outputs together. So um, we can show and we can see that it's okay. We can replace like a 2D array the way that we had with a 2D array based on distributed PLLs. Um, and, and there, there is uh, there is an argument that well, if we do this, we should be able to adjust the phase and frequency and have a have a very good way of creating a two D array. So we went ahead and uh, made a prototype of this. So the idea of this prototype is we have a bunch of oscillators, and we connect them with with a few PLLs with different. Uh, you can see there are different configurations, like the the one in the the the, the top left is just one source, the other is like two. In series three, four, like a loop structure, triangular loop, rectangular loop, all kinds of different ways. Um, what, what we what we observe is that in here, it's the phase noise doesn't degrade that much if we connect them together. But at some point, if we make the array larger than a certain size, it just fails to fails to synchronize again. So we have a similar problem. And uh, this is something that we couldn't see from Monte Carlo simulation or any other thing. So we wonder why, why that is. Uh, so we went back and looked into it. And then we, we noticed that, well, if we just have a, a second order PLL, it kind of calibrates the phase between them. Now there's some error between VCO1 and VCO2, but that's okay. Uh, but what happens is that on top of the actual way of controlling these two frequencies, we still have this parasitic coupling between the VCO. So we for, we know that that's there. Um, what happens, which is that this is a completely independent path, although it's the same frequency, but what happens is that because there is some phase shift already there between these two, and this directly couples to it, because of the divide by N that we have, we have a loop that amplifies this error independent of the actual loop that is supposed to correct it. So this means that we have a high gain feedback loop, which is not necessarily stable. And overall, this makes the whole structure unstable as we scale it. So it would, it would actually fail to work because we have this parasitic line that works with our PLL. So even if we do this, because of the fact that 
we have this divide by n and the phase is amplitude by a factor of n in this division, uh, it seems like we have this instability. So high gain loop and unstable loop as a result of the divide by n. So, okay, so let's see how we can fix this. So we thought that the next thing we can do is to look into the, the, uh, the basic concept of a PLL, which is normally works this way. We have some phase detection in the baseband and we have a phase control, some phase adjustment in the RF. Now phase control is not always in the RF, but almost always phase detection is in the baseband. And the problem with having phase detection in the baseband is, as we know, we have this divide by N. So whatever phase error we have, when we divide something by N, that phase difference multiplies by N. So can we can we do something better? Can we can we replace? Can we shift? Can we switch these to get you know, so that the phase detection happens in the millimeter wave? So we directly measure the phase between the two VCOs, and then we do the phase control in the baseband. Now, again, doing the phase control in the baseband is not the main advantage. We can also do the phase control in the um, in the high frequency, but it seems like if we even if we do that, it'll, it's, it's even better because. We don't want to directly control our VCOs. We don't necessarily want to detune the tank. So um, if we put this and then put that on the baseband, we get two benefits. Uh, but, but you can see that one of the problems is, well, doing phase detection in millimeter wave is difficult. That's, that is why people don't do that. Traditionally, we just down convert everything and then we do the detection. Uh, so we have to figure that out. We have to figure out a way that we can do phase detection. And it's not just about phase detection. Because we are interested in adjusting the phases in a predictable way, so we have to be able to do it in a in an accurate way. So, um, so what, what, if you look into what people have done, and people have have done have done direct detection. This is a like a very simple way of phase detection, just using a mixer. So you can see that if we have a mixer, if we multiply these two frequencies, you would have an output that is proportional to the phase difference. Uh, so instead of doing a divide, so you can see that if we have a cosine of omega t and cosine of omega t plus delta theta, if we multiply them and pass it through a low-pass filter, we have a term, term that is proportional to this cosine of delta theta, which means that we can technically have a relationship between the output, um, uh, the, the, the phase difference, and uh, something in the baseband. So people have used this um, in you know, subsampling PLLs in a way um, it's not exactly a mixer, but also millimeter wave mixers. Um, there is some recent work that have demonstrated that you can do this control loop to adjust the phase. So, so how does it look like this work? Typically, the way it works is that um, the same way any kind of loop works. You have a control signal of a high gain loop. So that cosine of omega delta theta goes to a gain. That could be an integrator or anything, which adjusts the phase of the second VCO. And this loop becomes stable when this error, which is our cosine of delta theta, becomes small, right? So normally, these kind of loops settle when there is a phase difference of uh, pi over two between uh, the adjacent elements. Uh, you know, even in uh, you know a digital phase detector, this is the same thing. You can see that the two clocks are ninety degree out of phase for the average to be zero. Uh, okay, so so that's fine. I mean, pi over two is not really what we want. We want to have any any phase. Uh, so to, to do that, we can introduce some sort of phase shift. Uh, so if we think about it, well, we can technically introduce some phase shift before the gain, between before the VCO, before the uh, first VCO, second VCO, or even like after the down conversion in the baseband. And that would, in theory, shift the phase, right? So we can have some sort of phase control. But this doesn't work in a phase in a predictable way. We know that as soon as we introduce a phase shifter to anywhere, there is going to be asymmetry. If we introduce it in the RF, that's the phase shifter that you put in one, one side of the VCO, but how would that exactly, uh, it, it's gonna make a lot of asymmetry in the system. It's uh, gonna introduce errors. Uh, so, so we can control the phase, but we're not really detecting exactly what the phase is. Uh, so we have to have a better way to detect the phase, but we want to rely on something like this, like a mixer-based scheme that is not um, that that is a lot more accurate. So, um, so people have uh, done things like this in optics. In fact, the concept of interferometer has been used as a way to measure the phase between two sources. So why not use this the same the same way in a 
in a millimeter wave system. So you can see that the idea is if we have these two sources and we apply uh, them through a matched line, there's going to be an interference pattern, right? That's this you can in this example, if they're all both in phase, the interference pattern would just have a peak right at the center. So theoretically, if we can look at the pattern and measure the amplitudes, measure the envelope of these amplitudes through some power detectors, uh, we can get a sense of the, the phase shift. Um, but the benefit of this is it doesn't involve anything active. It doesn't involve any kind of actual phase shift, right? So I'll, I'll say how we do the phase shift, but it doesn't involve anything that isn't. So the whole interference pattern is constructed through passive structures, which should, which should in theory be as accurate as uh, the, the way that we can, that we can produce uh, the passive lines on a chip. So what this is going to do is, it's gonna give us a mapping between the phase shift. And as we change the phase, you can see that it's going to just push the envelope to the left and right. So it's just a very physical change in the location of the interference versus the phase shift. So we are absorbing the concept of the mixing and the phase shift all into this passive structure instead of separating them into you know, uh, error-prone components. Uh, so, um, and in fact, it turns out that it's much better to use the valley of the interference as opposed to the peak because the valley is a lot more sensitive. If we, if we think about the relationship, we took two peak detectors right up the two sides and measure the difference between their voltages, it's going to be a very, it's going to be a very sharp transition. So, so, so basically the idea is that um, we, can, we can choose whatever location we want the valley to be, we choose the page, phase peak detectors there. And we make sure that all, through a loop, the pattern moves into that location. So we don't actually measure the phase shift. We force the phase shift to be something that we want to be by picking the right peak detectors. So if the peak detectors are right at the middle, that means that the phase shifts are the same or in this case, 100 degree out of phase. But we know that that's easy to make, right? Because everything is differential in our circuits anyways. Uh, and the other thing is, well, depending, we, we, need, we need a minimum length. The length at least has to be lambda over two to be able to, to go and get the whole phase shift. Otherwise, we're gonna have redundancy. So that's just a minor detail. So in terms of implementation, what, what we're actually doing is we have this transmission line that we load it with these power peak detectors. We have to make sure that it's uh, periodically loaded so that the transmission line characteristic doesn't change. The peak detectors have to be fairly small. So that's a design challenge, but uh, it, it is doable. And then whichever peak we, we choose, it would correspond to a different phase profile. So it would correspond to a different desired phase. So we know that if we, let's say, choose the peak detector I and I plus one, it's going to give us a phase shift of, let's say, 30 degree. So we can adjust the phase steps and we can adjust the exact phase that we want. And this is, a, this is an example of the loop, right? We have uh, two transmitters going through a multiplier chain through a high, low frequency LO. Um, so the, the, the transmitter, uh, we would just measure the phase between them through this interferometer. And then we have a baseband loop. We have a loop filter. We have a phase shifter in the baseband that adjust the relative phases with each other. I won't go into the details of the loop filter and the phase shift because those are like uh, mostly uh, analog circuits. Um, phase shifting at low frequency is like at RF is fairly simple. We can use anything as long as it gives us a phase shift. It doesn't have to be accurate, right? The point is we don't care about this accurate. It's just that it has to give us enough range so we can tune the interferometer to where we want because the measurement is based on the location of the, the peak detector. So, and so, so, so in theory, we can scale this. We can just connect them together in like, this is a 1D structure, but it could also be 2D. Um, so, so this first prototype we had is we put both of them on, on a single chip. So it's not a phaser, really. It's just about showing that uh, in principle, the interferometer works. And we look into the phase difference between them. So on the, on the, what you see on the, on the right side is the measured phase that we have between the adjacent elements versus um, the pair of peak detectors that we have chosen. So by choosing different peak detectors, we can just get to a different phase. And um, it's fairly 
uh, equal in steps and pretty broadband. I mean, in theory, it has to be completely flat, but it's not because we also have buffers and other stuff that limits the bandwidth. So in principle, this works. And one of the nice things about the structure is that um, because we're not changing anything in the RF. Yes. Is, so you don't have on-chip PCOs for this, right? Or we don't. We okay. just have a multiplier chain. So, so you're taking inputs in to do your, so, so like to, to do your, your you, you start off with off-chip sources and then you do multipliers. Yeah. So, so in, the, in this scheme, um, the frequencies are the same. We just have like a three gigahertz signal going in through a multiplier chain. But you need two independent frequencies. No, they have to be, the, it's just the same thing. So you're, you're phase shifting the signals. At we don't, yeah, that's the thing. We don't care about the phase shift between what we apply. Mm -hmm. The phase shift happens in millimeter wave. So we just route it through some trivial routing. It doesn't have to, it can be, it doesn't have to be like H3 or anything. Yeah. There's, the detection happens in millimeter wave. The phase shifting is and not the basement, a, yeah. is a basement. Yeah, the basement. Like if you look into, if I can show you, oops. If I can show you what, what happened. I'm going to show you this. And this is like uh, the output of the peak detectors are in DC, and then you have a phase, okay. and then you're multiplying up. So and then we go back up, right? Okay. Yeah, exactly. So it's kind of like a daisy chain in that sense. The, the LO goes through the, the daisy chain of phase shifters. So, uh, so, so what is, what's nice about this, uh, this structure is that um, its phase noise is uh, really comparable to. Uh, even frequency multipliers, although this is actually a loop, it adjusts the phase, uh, but uh, it's quite comparable with PLLs and uh, it's, it's almost better than a regular PLL, but maybe that's not a very fair comparison, although it's comparable with uh, frequency multipliers. So it is a good way to produce LO. That's the, that's the point. Um, and then the next step is to actually make a phase array. So we thought that let's do another tape out. And in this tape out, Oh, thank you. Nice. So in this tape out, we, uh, we, we put the two transmitters on two different chips. And the third chip is the interferometer in the middle. So in this way, we have a symmetric structure. We, we don't want to put the interferometer one of them. So we have the first chip, the second chip interferometer, the third chip would be the second transmitter. Uh, they're both, they're all the same chip, right? But it's just we're orienting them in a different way to use them as a, uh, as a transmitter or a detector. So um, the way that uh, the, only, the, only inter the only connections that matter, if you notice here, that are high frequency, are the connections between the chips, the transmitter, the transmission line in the middle, and the transmission line to the transmitter on the other side. So for that, we did a, uh, we, 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 we thought about what's the best way to do it. And it turns out that if we, if we set the wire bonds um, to the right distance, we can create, we can create an impedance, characteristic impedance that's fairly close to the transmission line, something around 65, uh, 70 ohm. Um, of course, we did the wire bonds manually just to make sure that um, the chip-to-chip -chip wire bonding, um, I don't think, our supplier would do it, but it's fairly simple. It's just that we just, instead of going to the transmission line, we directly connect it to uh, the next chip. So uh, so this would mean that, um, of course, the loop is also in the baseband. So we have uh, the signal coming out from the third chip going to the first chip. And the control loop is on the third chip. So we have the whole loop operation between three chips, but uh, the high frequency one is the one that uh, is on the sensitive one. Um, and, and if you think about the PCB, of course, this is a high frequency PCB. We use, we use, uh, we use like the millimeter wave PCB, but it's just a two layer one in this case. We, 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 we don't really have any need to have very complicated H3 interconnect. The only high frequency connection is actually not going to the PCB. It's just between chip to chip interconnects. Now, if you can argue maybe going to the PCB and connecting them to a PCB is better, uh, but we made the choice not to do that for this prototype. Um, and then, of course, there are wire bonds that go to the PC, but those are like the low frequency ones. And just some simulation to show that, well, we did, uh, we can see that um, it works uh, pretty well. Uh, it's a fairly broad band in terms of the S11 of the wire bond. And uh, then we also have the, the antennas. So you can see that on the, on the figure on the right uh, bottom, three of the chips, 
And um, there is a chip to chip interconnect and there's a chip to antenna interconnect. And that's not exactly a GSG because there's a fan out, um, but we, uh, we still uh, think that I mean, uh, if we take into account the impedance and everything, can do a good job in matching this. So the measurement that we did uh, in the in the chamber, we basically, uh, and you can see it in the board if you look carefully, there are two rows. That's just for us to have two different versions because we don't know exactly what the set of frequency of the antenna is. So we, we just measured and saw which one is better. We just went with that. Uh, and then uh, we have a bunch of chips here. In this case, uh, you can't see, but we have like seven transmitters and six interferometers. Um, and um, so for the beam pattern, what are we doing? We're basically controlling that delta phi, right? That we're, we're using the interferometer to adjust the delta phi between the, all the elements. And then we just look at the, the theta of the beam pattern. So over the air, we look at the beam. Uh, and you can see um, on the figure on the right, the phase setting represents delta phi, and um, the uh, the beam angle represents theta. Um, there is uh, there are two there are two uh, there are two lines you can see. The first line, um, the blue line, is the theoretical expected angle from what we actually measure for the phase shift between the two chips. So we know that if we set the phase to like the peak detector 10 and 11, we expect a phase shift of let's say 25 degree. And we put that 25 degree into that equation of uh, sine inverse of delta phi over pi and we calculate the angle. And we're just comparing that with what we measure. So this does indicate that um, we just by controlling these locally, we can get a pretty good uh, uh, prediction of the angle just by setting things, excuse me. So, so it's a little bit more measurements. So what we have here is um, just the scaling. I just want to show you that when you go from five elements, let's say to seven elements, um, the, the main beam is, is very closely follows the simulation, both in terms of angle and beam width. Now, the side lobes don't look as good. So we're looking into why. Um, my guess is like a lot of coupling is on the PCB and things we haven't simulated because we just simulate one antenna. Uh, but again, that's, a, that's something for us to think about. Um, and then we can see that, well, uh, EIRP versus uh, the number of elements that kind of scales as we expect. So just a demonstration that, yeah, I mean, we get the same trend. Uh, I think I also missed the, yeah, this is another that is showing the two extremes plus minus 30 degree uh, beam scanning that we get uh, with two extreme points on the on the plot. Yeah. Is that Calibration from this manual? Which calibration? So you have n phase shift first settings. Yeah. We don't do any calibration. The only thing that we, the thing that we're doing here is, um, you see the blue line? That is the measured phase that we have. Measured phase. From the VNA. So, so we actually have a simple setup that is just two transmitters and one interferometer. So we set the, we, we choose, the peak detectors and just measure what phase shift we get using VNAs on two sides. So we measure delta phi, right? Uh, and we're just comparing that, but this there is no calibration if that's what you're asking. So this is directly just by setting the peak detector and just measuring the beam angle. Maybe I didn't get it. So EIs are controllable, are they not? Delta phi. Delta phi? Yes, they are. So, so they're controlled, but there's something that you control. We do. How do you control them? Oh, we control them by, you know, you know the peak detectors on the transmission line? Yeah. Those, the control is very discrete, right? So let's say if we have 20 peak detectors, yeah. we can have 19 pairs. Sure. So each of them would correspond to... Well, which, how do you know which one to take is my question? Because no, 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 what the, we know the response of interferometer. Like for instance, if we took the very middle ones, it corresponds to delta phi of zero. But that's only if the, there is no mismatch between the two. Between the between the two uh, paths, the two millimeter signals. That's true. That's so, uh. I, I thought the whole point is that this should mitigate the effect of mismatches. So we aren't. Yeah, Am but. Is a feedback loop to adjust it until it makes it the norm. 
So you, if I understood right, you, you measure at one point and then you have a feedback loop yeah. to adjust the phase until that point becomes the null. Yeah. And then you know that the phase shift should be that, right? So the only error that happens if, if you're asking where is the mismatch, the mismatch, the two sources, right? They have the same frequency, but they have a random phase. Yeah. Right. But because of the interferometer in the middle, yes. we measure what phase we are, right? Ideally, let's say if they're exactly the same phase with 980 degree uh, polarity, the middle point of the interferometer, the physically the middle point, would be where you would expect the valley to happen. So what you're saying is that for you, when you set the measurement that you're showing right now, all you did is that you set uh, the peak detector to correspond to the middle point. We did. And you got this result. We got this result. So zero, you can see phase zero, which is this one. This corresponds to the phase setting of 10, which is like the middle one. So we have like 20 peak detectors. The 10 is the one oh, that- Oh, phase setting means the number of- Yeah, so yeah. It's so like we have like 20 peak detectors. I'm reading them as degrees, so I don't- Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah I think that's a... All right, so um, yeah. Well, uh, I think uh, this is a proof of concept. There's a lot more work to be done, but I think what we like to do is to, um, you know, get more money to get the, build a larger array. We want to do 2D. I think that's really where we can show the benefits of this. Uh, and I don't think this is a solution that's going to fix everything. It's something that has to be combined with other existing solutions. Maybe it's something that's good for multi-chip scaling, but inside the chip, I think the existing structures are good enough. Uh, however, this really changes at different frequencies. And if you go to like even higher frequencies, this might be even better for on chip implementation. Question. Yeah. What problem are you trying to solve? I'm sorry? What problem are you trying to solve? We're trying to solve the connection, the LO distribution uh, in the array. So why why should I, if, if I have base shippers per element? Yeah. Why should I care? Because if you have phase shifter between elements, no then... per element. So let's say that my my distribution is asymmetric, <coughs> but then I can control the phase shifter. Yes, if I want. but you have to calibrate that. So the so the problem for solve is calibration. Yes, you have to you want to calibrate that at very large scale, uh, which would be a complex and time consuming. So we want to we want to basically make something that is low cost. But it's deterministic, right? And it's deterministic. No, no, no. The calibration so once you have your system calibrate for one array the rest of them are all the same yeah but the thing about calibration is now if you talk to some people they would say you would only have to do it once but calibration is something you have to do if it's a static lookup table if your temperature changes if your supply changes you have to do it you have to keep doing it once in a while point of this is this is phase control but it actually phase alignment so it's keep monitoring it is monitoring this in a loop and it's making sure that the phase is what you want you know, as things change. And you only want to do this for the LO, not for a large length signal, right? So this is LO. Yeah, you, the question of how you apply the modulation is a good question. We haven't thought about it. But this is really, at this point, this is about making sure we apply LOs with the right phases to the... So so at the moment, so let's say Starlink has a currently product. So how do they do this, do you know? So normally what they have is like in the multi-tier approach, um, Inside the chips, they have phase shifters, mm -hmm. but then we have they have like PLLs that uh, makes the frequencies for them. And then the way they can, the way they adjust the phase and they calibrate, it's normally over the air. Like they, they normally have their array, they put it in front of something and they just adjust the phases in some algorithm, right? Basement algorithm to make sure that they get the beam, right? That's how it's done. And in fact, if you want to do multiple, you have to do this for all different beams that you want. So it's not just one calibrate here for you have to also adjust, you have to go rotate it, do like this, that. So that's the question that I asked. So do you know how they do it? Is that how you do that's it? That's how they, I like for example, for Starlink, I know that's how they do it. Which is what Starlink for, Starlink, for each for each Starlink they ship, they go to yeah. testing on their in their facility. Yeah. So they go through this beam. Yeah, just to have a lookup table connected. Each one separate. Yeah. So you can imagine that if you want to do 
if you want to avoid calibration and you want to do beam forming, right? The way that it's typically done is you have these lookup tables and as array scales and you want to have like many angles, then it's not a trivial thing. The time for calibration, a lot of things. Uh, so, 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 so this would uh, this would take care of that. This would alleviate the problem for uh, scaling. Okay. So, um, how much time do I have? Um, like an hour and thirty minutes, right? Yeah. An hour and thirty minutes. Thirty, 30 minutes. Uh, okay. <laughs> Sorry, oh. Professor TC. I have a question. Okay, that's good. So, so the second part, I want to shift gears. Talk about something uh, a little bit different. That is, uh, that is sensing. And when I talk about sensing, I mean from a wireless point of view, I'm talking about radars. So uh, I think it's very clear to people in this room why, what's the benefit of radars. There's a lot of emerging applications for vehicles and autonomous and robotics and things that uh, would, would really benefit from um, having this wireless sensing. So um, what's, the, what's the challenge here? So this is one of the questions that we had. Why is it that we don't have uh, radars ubiquitous let's say in our phones or like in our cars or like a lot of things that you can imagine can benefit from is we, we have cameras, right? But we don't have a lot of those uh, wireless sensors. Um, so, so a little bit of background, um, if, you have a, if, you have, if you have studied radars, you will see that there are typically two approaches for implementing radars. There is the more common thing that you would hear more, which is FMCW, right? And the FMCW, uh, would uh, would rely on measuring um, you know the Doppler as a result of a chirp frequency that is applied, and without really going to the details, the FMCW is really uh, advantageous in terms of its processing. Right, the compression that happens in the FMCW is really happening in the front end. So there is a mixer, and then there is a low speed A to the after that. So it's very simple to implement. It's low power, so you can actually have. High frequency people have demonstrated like 200 gigahertz FMCW radars, which is amazing. Uh, but the problem is, it's very hard, or I would say expensive or power hungry. There's a lot of challenges with creating a chirp, especially if you want to have it broadband. And and um, it's a it's a relative term, right? You can always there's a lot of work. Um, you guys are also doing uh, some of the work to create these chirps, but. Just comparing it with a single tone, it's a lot of work. So um, it's a lot of cost. But the, the, the other side, PMCW or pulse radars, they just rely on a single source, right? You're just applying the source and we're modulating the amplitude, like it's kind of like a QPSK or a BPSK. Uh, so this kind of digital modulation um, is a lot more flexible. And it's something that people have initially really started with, radar started with digital modulation. Uh, but then at some point they realized that we can't do it beyond a certain speed because the processing that happens in uh, for a digital signal to be detectable, you, you need to have that compression or that filter, right? That filter for a digital modulation is typically an FIR filter, which is implemented in the in the in the digital. So the digital implementation of the FIR filter means that um, the bandwidth of the A to D has to be twice as fast as the bit stream, right? So we think about millimeter wave, we're talking about like two, five, 10 gigahertz of bandwidth. Maybe if we go higher in frequency, um, it's very costly to have an A to D with that kind of uh, sample rate, right? especially if we care about dynamic range. So the operation of pulse radars typically has been limited to lower frequency, like 10 megahertz, like a, a simpler kind of like lower frequency, uh, low resolution radars. Now, um, our thinking is that uh, in the age that everything is becoming digital, and there are clear benefits to having a digital radar uh, <clears throat> with the flexibilities that it gives us, what can we do to make it more efficient? What can we do to make a multi-gigabit per second pulse radar without the, the, the drawbacks um, that uh, comes with like a watt-level radar? Um, so let's look at just a very simple example for that. You know, um, a car, right? If it's moving at a speed of 200 kilometers per hour, which uh, I don't know where you can, but that's like a, uh, like a maybe racetrack. Um, and we, we use a radar at the 80 gigahertz carrier frequency. And if we care, care about a range resolution of 10 centimeters, right? It's a decent accuracy for detecting objects for a car. 
You know, for a radar, um, there are two quantities that we detect. The first thing is we call the range resolution. It's the delay, the round trip delay of the pulse, which gives us uh, a measurement of the distance. And the other thing is measure is how fast things are changing. What's the, what's the speed or in a way the Doppler shift. Now, if we compare uh, these two in this example, um, the range resolution, if we want to have a 10 centimeter range resolution, from the fundamentals of radar, the bandwidth that we need for the processing is around one and a half gigahertz. But on the other hand, if we look into the Doppler shift that happens with this speed, the Doppler shift is, that's the wrong colors, is only 30 kilohertz. So what does this tell us? It tells us that the radar really has two different time scales. There is this fast time, and it's a, it's a well-known concept, but uh, as an introduction, there is a fast time that is the range resolution, and then there is a Doppler. And Doppler, you can see, we can do it in software. I mean, it doesn't matter. I mean, we actually don't need any circuit to measure that. We can just sample the data and just look at it uh, in MATLAB, and that's good enough. So uh, the, the main thing that is limiting the processing is the range resolution. So what's the problem now? Well, the flow of si a signal flow in a typical radar is we have our down conversion, we have quantization. And then we have our DSP that is operating at at least twice this band, like at the three gigahertz DSP. And three gigahertz DSP, uh, you guys would know that takes a lot of power. It's, it's a lot of resources. It's a very, very, very expensive thing to do. So uh, what can we do? Maybe, um, maybe we can think about um, a different way to do the signal. What about we consider doing the, the correlation or the fast time compression of the signal in the analog domain. Uh, so this is this gives us the, the opportunity to do the, the high speed part of um, the radar processing before the A to D so that the A to D can be low speed, kind of like the FMCW. So we get the benefit of FMCW that is uh, simple back end processing uh, without uh, you know, the, the disadvantages. So that's uh, that, that that's our idea. That's that's uh, we want to do analog. We want to do analog processing for the high speed. And you know, analog processing is something that has been it's a very old concept. Um, a lot of things, everything used to be analog processing before microcontrollers uh, came uh, showed up, right? Uh, but um, there there is there is there is benefits to um, digital that everybody move. We have programmability. We have accuracy, so these things have pushed everything to digital. Uh, but but there are still benefits to an analog front end. The analog front end means that uh, we can all we, an analog front end is always going to be faster than a digital front end. Right, whatever speed you get in digital, you can get ten times faster with analog. Um, so it's going to be and for or you can say for the same speed, you're going to consume much lower power. But of course, it comes with a cost, right? Analog has a limited power. We have noise, we have supply, we have a lot of things we have to consider. So if we, if we want to do analog, we have to look into all the drawbacks and just make sure that we understand the trade-off. We understand what are the limitations, what are the issues that we have to be aware of when we design the circuit. So with this in mind, uh, we went uh, ahead and implemented um, the correlator for this structure. And the correlator in a very basic uh, form is uh, basically we have a delay between two signals, the received signal and the transmitted signal. Uh, and uh, it goes through a multiplier integrator chain uh, with some uh, feedback to what, what we will talk. And at the end, the output of this correlator is just a digital output. It's just a digital output that represents um, what, is the, uh, what is the total integrated output for that particular delay. So let's 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 look a little bit more into what an analog correlator operation would look like. So we have in this case we have x of t and y of t. X of t is a representation of the receive signal, the base band receive signal. Y of t is our reference, is whatever that we have sent. So there is a delay between these two, and then we have a clock, which is uh, the whole operation is clock. So the the integrator output, you can see as well, just the product of these two and an integration, which, you know, when when they are in phase, um, the integrator goes up, when they're just opposite, goes down. So this is a normal operation of an integrator. 
And the, and the ideal correlator will look like. Now, the first thing that happens once we have an analog circuit is that we can't go, we can't do this forever, right? There is a limit. We have dynamic range, we have supply limits. So we have to, we have to monitor this. Uh, so we, uh, we have to make sure that as, as long as the integrator is within a certain range, it's okay, but if it goes above or below the linear range of operation, we have to do some reset. So this is the first thing we introduce. We introduce an integrator reset loop, uh, which just means that as soon as the integrator goes above a certain level, we just bring it back. And we have a counter, right? We just keep that in. Okay, we just re re record that. We have done one down, so minus one, plus one. So we basically have a digital counter that uh, keeps uh, track. Um, so, so what happens, one of, one of the problems that happens when we have this is that our, our comparators, our comparators that we have are clocked comparators. It's not just, it's constantly monitoring the analog output, right? There is certain once in a while, we can have a have a, have an operation that amplifies and measures, amplifies and measures. So this is the first non-ideality. When we have a clocked operation, the comparator is not necessarily going to do the reset at the right time. So there is going to be an overshoot. We call this an overshoot error. That uh, means that it's going to be an, the error that we're not detecting. We're not really resetting at the right time. So we're adding some unknown quantity to this. And there's also a quantization error at the end. So this is uh, the integrator at the very end. Whatever residue we have, we're not quant we're not measuring that. We're just measuring the number of resets. So we have an overshoot error and quantization error, kind of like what an A to D has. Right, the data converter also has a quantization error. It doesn't have an overshoot error. This is like something new. Um, but in terms of the operation of them in nature, um, they are all as a result of doing analog signal processing in the front end. There are, there are these um, uncertainties that are introduced. Uh, and and to what, as, as far as we can tell, these are the main two things just from circuit simulation. So, um, uh, so what I want to show you here is a little bit of analysis uh, so, so the two figures on the right um, show you the amplitude of the integration and overshoot error as a result of the signal power. Now, the, the quantization error is kind of similar to an A to D, like it's a sawtooth. So as your signal increases, at some points your error is zero, at some point it's, there is a maximum. So that's like a quantization error. The overshoot error is a little bit different because it accumulates, because it's not it's an information that it, every time you do a reset, you have an error that is added. So if your signal power is large, if you're doing more resets, it just accumulates over time. So there is this behavior that's kind of like sawtooth, but it's, uh, it, it's a little bit different. So anyways, uh, we can do a similar analysis that we do for um, you know, random noise in data conversions and come up with numbers for the signal quantization ratio, which I'll just uh, skip here for the interest of time. And here, what, what I have is, a transient representation of. So we want to verify that our analysis, that is a numeric, our, our, our estimation of the SNR is similar uh, to the time domain waveforms. So we do like a time domain transient simulation of the uh, of the correlator. Uh, so, so, so what you can see here is um, the comparison between our calculation and uh, the output as a result of the, tran the transient behavior. Uh, so this tells us that for a single tone, uh, the response, the single for a single target, uh, the output of the correlator versus the input power is kind of predictable. Uh, so that's good. We have a good understanding. Um, once we introduce a secondary target, things become a little bit more difficult. And the reason is that when we have when we have a strong primary target and a secondary target, um, they um, it's the same thing, it's kind of the same thing that when we have a receiver that has a strong uh, blocker. The blocker is going to be passed through the filter the same way as uh, the weak signal is. So the behavior of the filter would be limited or determined mainly by the strong signal. So the same thing happens here. And this is, this is in a way a time domain filter, right? It's a filter that is happening in, uh, in a time domain. So something similar happens. When we have a primary target that is strong, if you look into the response of the integrator, it kind of looks like this, goes up, comes down. On average, it's zero, but the waveform is dominated by the primary. And then we have a secondary. Oh, I'm going the other way. So we have the primary, 
And then if we have a secondary, that secondary kind of shifts like a slow, slow slope. So on average, the number of resets kind of tilts toward up or down, depending on the, the amplitude of the secondary. So, so this would mean that we have to do another different analysis for this. Uh, so for this, uh, I would uh, just quickly uh, mention that we have a course model that quant quantizes these steps um, to give us an understanding of every time we have uh, a value, what is the probability of up versus down? And then we go ahead and refine this by incorporating those residue values. Mm -hmm. So, okay. What am, what am I showing? I'm just showing you um, a numerical representation of the Markov chain that is happening. This is an algorithm to calculate the expected output as a result of an input. And in this algorithm, again, it's just a way to represent the formula in, a, in, in an algorithm. So we just have a Markov chain that represents the probability of up and down. Excuse me. All right, and this is the um, a few simulations. I'm, uh, what I'm showing you is the correlator output for a single target and the two target, you can see on the top, because the same primary target is smaller, the secondary target can be detected. And this one, it can't. So this is just, um, uh, I just want to show you that, well, the impact of a strong primary is, uh, is quite important. The one on the right is showing simulation versus our, uh, our theory. So the blue line is the transient simulation of the secondary output as a result of a primary output. So overall, you can see as the primary output increases, the minimum detectable secondary increases. So this is a way to say, well, as your primary signal is stronger, your sensitivity drops. Um, there is this interesting notches that you can see, right? It's not like it's just like the course model just tells you that it goes up. There are these, these notches. So this represents the points where the overshoot error is zero. So if you're right, if your clock is right exactly proportional to the slope of your primary, you can kind of cancel that, that impact. Uh, but that's like a very specific point. Uh, it might be something that can be used, uh, but the overall trend is that as you increase this primary power, your sensitivity uh, kind of goes up. So, um, so after analyzing this, um, we just, uh, uh, thought about implementing this concept. There's a little bit of system specifications of what the target uh, uh, design wants to be for our lab environment. The, the power that we need, uh, we can get from a TSMC process. Um, and for the target that we're measuring, what is the minimum uh, gain of the antenna, uh, the limit, the minimum number of signal string that we can have to get uh, the right processing gain. So, <clears throat> Okay, I'm just showing you the correlated circuit here, uh, which is uh, the sequence, a mixer, an OTA, a high gain OTA, and a comparator, right? So the circuits here are fairly standard, uh, uh, but uh, the only point I want to point out is the, the, the OTA, we want to make sure it's very high gain so that it's leakage, the integrated leakage is minimized. Um, and then the RF front end um, kind of includes the whole thing, the baseman, um, the LMA, the PA. So the RF front end has both a transmitter and a receiver. Um, as a, as just a layout showing you the, all the different blocks. So the LO, um, a, one, of the, one of the most difficult parts of the RF design was the LO because um, turns out 65 nanometer is not a good design process to have a 70 gigahertz LO. It's uh, we, we should have done, we, we should have gone to the lower frequency. So it took us a long time to the LO, the, the LNA and the PA, uh, fairly standard processes. Uh, now, I mean, you can see that uh, the chip has a transmitter receiver, but one of the, the nice things about uh, a radar is you don't need the transmitter receiver to be on the same chip. In fact, we don't. We can have them separately because the only thing that is shared between the TX and RX is, in fact, the clock. Everything else is separate. <clears throat> Uh, so this is the measurement setup. Uh, you can see here, the measurement setup we have here is there are two chips. Um, and each of the chips has their own probe and antenna. Now, the chips, we put them at the same place just because uh, we don't have an antenna in this setup at this point. So we have to use our probe station. Um, but the point is, the only thing that they're sharing is the clock. 
So, and we call this the bi-static sensing. In a way, the transmitter and receiver are separate. So <clears throat> the first measurement that we're making is uh, we use the same chip to measure the transmitter and receive. Um, so so th this is just to indicate that if we had used the, the same chip for the transmitter and receive, we would have this large spillover. Just whatever we do, we're going to have substrate coupling between transmitter and receivers, completely unavoidable. Um, so <clears throat> and this just verifies that, well, we have an SOC noise floor. Uh, we haven't really investigated that noise floor that much, but we know it's there. It has to do with the noise figure of the circuit. Uh, and then um, the next measurement we're doing is we are separating them. We have a transmitter and a receiver. And you can see that what we, what we have here is the digital output of the correlator as a function of delay. And the delay is something digital. We're just setting different delays for um, the digital delays between the transmitter and receiver. Uh, clocks, and uh, we just look at the output. So this is the background. So there is clutter, there is uh, uh, SOC noise, things like that. But we don't have the self-interference peak. That is the point. That's zero. It's almost nothing. So that's just one difference between this and uh, the multi, the, the same chip result. And then, um, then once we introduce a target, right? Once we introduce a target, we can see that well, the target corresponds to a peak. At a delay, right? Now that that delay is something that we can use to measure the distance. It's a basic concept of a pulse radar. So I'm just showing you two different uh, data points here, like 2.85, 1.35, and the amplitude of course changes too because we have to, as you put the target closer, the power also increases. So it's two things, but we don't care about the power at this point. We just want to measure the delay for this prototype. So um, so so what 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 we have here is like a more comprehensive measurement. We're just putting the target at a distance that we're measuring with our with our tape and just measuring the delay that corresponds to that on the correlator. And the formula is just a formula that measures the actual distance from the round trip delay. So we're comparing the actual measured distance from tape and the measured distance from the radar. So um it, it, it's, it follows the, the, the measurement pretty well. There's, there's, there is some mismatch, but the point is the slope is the same and it kind of follows it all along from uh, over like very close to four meter, which is the furthest point we have in our lab. And we also measure the distance just to show that uh, the RMS error of our measurement is around 11 centimeters. So, <clears throat> and just for reference, this is a one gigahertz clock. So if we use the, the, the fundamental uh, radar equation, the, the resolution of this radar is 15 centimeters. Now, RMS of 11 centimeters doesn't mean that we're beating anything fundamental. It's just the error. So the error is good. I mean, if, if it was a perfect radar, the error should be much lower, maybe like two, three centimeters, but it's still something that if we compare with others, other radars out there, um, I mean, the first thing that uh, was even surprising to us is nobody actually reports their measurement precision. So um, that's uh, something that we have reported. We can't compare it with others, but we're just saying, well, our RMS error is 11.6 centimeters. Uh, and um, the other thing I want to point out is the baseline power. The baseline power we have is substantially lower than others uh, because our baseband, and we're, of course, we're just comparing it with uh, FMCW, uh, PMs and pulse radar, but F even FMCW radars have more uh, base, uh, baseband power. I don't know exactly what that is, but I'm going to guess it's mostly the PLLs. Uh, so the, the PLL design is, is high power. But uh, we have, uh, it's, it's, the, the point is, it's a very low energy and at the same time, precise ways to, way to measure the distance, the, the distance for radar. So <clears throat> I think we can, we can use this concept and the, the idea that we're trying to do right now in our lab is to make a complete module uh, with the antenna. So we have a low power module and we can use it to for uh, doing uh, localization, uh, using this in the multiple sensor scheme to uh, do a lot of interesting things that uh, still is not a lot around out there. So if we have a good hardware, we can hopefully use this to uh, get to do a lot of explorations on the capabilities of radar. So I like to give credit to specifically 12 of my students uh, who have been working on uh, the radar and phaser project. Um, uh, Racing, he has graduated, he's working in NXP now, um, but um, my uh, uh, the second student, uh, she's still here and uh, doing 
um, basically still continue doing excellent work. I also want to thank our sponsors, obviously, and our collaborators, and, and thank you for uh, staying. And uh, if you have any questions, I'm happy to uh, stay here. And, uh, so yeah, now we open the floor for questions. Um, uh, hi, Prof. Hi, Professor Tuzi. Can you hear me? Um, Arifan wanted to ask a question, but he didn't ask. So. Okay. I, I don't want to go to the chat, or I can, I can actually go to the chat. Let's see. Can you hear me? No. Yes. No. No. We cannot. Okay. Oh, these are all okay. So yeah. Is, yes, we were. So if you can send your question via texting. I guess I'm a short question. Um, there was a part that you were using the wire one at the transmission line. Yeah, that's right. Is that the same transmission line that you had the peak detector, or those are between the ch between the chips or between? No, the peak detectors are on chip. Okay. Yeah. So they're just like between the. Yes, they're just wires on chip connected very close to the transmission line. I don't think there's maybe uh, we can just put your email address and then yeah yeah if okay. oh I see so thanks professor to see for your great talk I wanted to ask a question regarding the phase A part as I realized the main motivator of the work was for avoiding the calibration okay what was it what is the question that? is to confirm what the motivation was to the calibration uh, that is the motivation is to make a simpler phase array. And uh, that simpler phase array, one of the challenges, in our opinion, is to the need to have calibration to get to any single angle for any single angle that you want. If the, right, what is happening right now is you all do over the air adjustment of all the phases to get to what you want. So um, if you want to do something that is uh, doesn't need that uh, mechanism, and it can monitor the phase over time without needing to do this. You know, every time something changes in your circuit, then um, this would be the. Is the mismatch technique, going back to the question that I asked earlier, now I can formulate it better in my head. What is the effect of mismatch of the path between each transmitter to the interferometer? <clears throat> That's it. So yeah. I think um, the effect of that mismatch is going to be, there are two things. There is um, the impedance mismatch would cause, if we have some sort of impedance mismatch, it means that your amplitudes are different and your phases that you have. So one of the, one of the things we struggled with was the buffers. Uh, so we had to make sure that the, the sim is completely symmetric on two sides so that the buffer that loads the T line on one side and the other T line on the other side are similar. And we have wire bonds, yeah. So, so we have to make sure the chip distances are similar to whatever manufacturing allows us. So we actually we don't do it ourselves. But we ask. So your hypothesis is that this going through this trouble is less than going through the trouble of edge network. Yes, because you know, first of all, you have to place your chips in lambda over two anyways. Right? That's that's something that you have to do. Yeah. Um, the only thing you have to take care of now is just this making sure this chip to this local connection is good. So you don't uh, actually you have to you have to perfect this single process. And once you figure that out, we can just do it very easily for. So the edge network, you need to perfect nothing because your edge network is on a PCB, so that's pretty accurate. Um, well, you can't do it in a single layer. It's like a like multi-layer PCB. You have to go through. It, it's 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 not actually an edge network, right? You have to do a lot of twists and turns for different paths between different tiles. For so, yellow, yeah. For if, if you want to make sure, if you want, well, if you want to make sure that you do, you don't want to do calibration, but if you want to do calibration, well, let's say you don't want to do calibration. So why can't the LL not be in single layer? Uh, well, because 
uh, you can't uh, have a high frequency connection through just a single layer. It has to be a transmission line. Well, you multiply out like by zero. But if you multiply up, you have the error, and you can't guarantee that if you, if you have a, like a one gigahertz LO going and you multiply up, if even if you have the mismatch between components, right? So each chip would have its own random phase, which is something that uh, you know you have the. So what the edge network will not have it, right? Uh, so is is the edge network at the target frequency or is it at? No, at the lower frequency. Let's say at the third frequency. Yes. Well, if it's at if it's at low frequency. If it's yeah. at low frequency, you actually don't care about mismatch because you have to do the calibration anyways. You don't need to, you don't, it doesn't matter that, that you do edge network. You just put things, we, we do don't, do because the, the, it's, it's as soon as you go on the chip, you have to multiply it. Yeah. And it's an active circuit and that multiplication is not predictable, right? Each, each, each of the chips would have their own phase error introduced. The mismatch of the circuits is, that, is certainly much more than um, if you want to, let's say a 60, 60 gigahertz, this a 60 gigahertz, yeah, a 60 gigahertz, your, uh, what is your period? Your period is, uh, um, I, uh, it's picoseconds. Yeah. Picoseconds, right? 10 picoseconds. 10 picoseconds. So, picoseconds. so just imagine that 10 degree phase shift would correspond to like femtosecond, 100 femtosecond. It's impossible to ensure that, right? If you just multiply things you know, chip to chip, there's like picoseconds of mismatch between them. You just have an inverter, right? Two inverters have at least one, two picosecond mismatch between them. So let alone if you have a multiplier chain, it will be completely random in, in, fa in practice. So, um, so you either have to do it completely millimeter wave, spend a lot of money like what uh, like San Diego does, uh, to do like ex very expensive high frequency boards that make sure everything is symmetric, or you just do the low cost way and just have a calibration scheme. Or ours that hopefully would solve that, that does it low cost and avoids calibration. Yeah, just to close the question on the Zoom. So he continued, based on the literature, there are some efforts from IBM to build a calibration-free phased array in their recent work by implementing an on-chip beam calculator. It may be irrelevant, but is there any advantage in your approach compared to an on-chip beam calculator? Yeah, I, I was actually very much involved in that project. Uh -huh. um, yeah, I mean, IBM's uh, design is pretty good. It's just that you still have to go through that very complicated H3 for multi-chip. So it's still like a $20,000 package. Uh, but yeah, I mean, you can make sure that you have good phase matching if you do that. Okay, that's it. So we would like to thank you again for the great talk. And please join me in uh, thanking again our speakers. Thank you.